Hi, guys. Thanks for keeping on listening. We are away on parental leave right now. Yes, but we still wanted to make sure that you guys had content to listen to while we were away. So here is one of our oldies but goodies. Check out the website for some updated notes on this particular episode since our recording. Hope you enjoy, and we'll see you when we're back. Okay, guys, welcome back. I'm Nick. This is Faye. And this is... Kriyag's Over Over Coffee. Coffee. Today, we'll be starting off with our first part of our three-part special on gestational diabetes. So today, we'll be talking about the physiology of insulin resistance in pregnancy, as well as the diagnosis and risk factors for GDM, and finally, some complications of GDM. Next time, we'll talk about the antenatal intrapartum management of gestational diabetes. And for our final part, we'll have a special for you all where we will be uh, doing a Q&A with Dr. Donald Kustan. Get excited. All right, so let's get started. Why don't we start talking about just physiology of insulin resistance in pregnancy, Faye? What causes pregnant women to get gestational diabetes? So if you recall back, Nick, to our physiologic changes of pregnancy episodes, we talked about how we needed to blame everything on progesterone. Yeah, I do remember that. And this is the same way with gestational diabetes. So really, it's the progesterone effects on insulin resistance. So normally, insulin binds to the insulin receptor. This leads to... Think back to medical school, phosphorylation of the beta subunit of the receptor and leads to phosphorylation of the insulin receptor substrate called IRS1. Progesterone reduces the expression of IRS1 and essentially makes the body more resistant to insulin. You need more insulin to start this whole cascade. Okay. The second part is human placental lactogen, and this also causes insulin resistance. It has both insulin-like and anti-insulin effects, and it increases lipolysis and free fatty acids. Got it. So just like in that old episode, human placental lactogen and progesterone, you can blame it for pretty much everything. Exactly. And same thing with GDM. So let's talk a little bit more about some background information, like the definition, we'll talk about prevalence, and of course, diagnosis. So Nick, what is gestational diabetes? To distill it down simply, it's, again, glucose intolerance in pregnancy. Um, And again, gestational diabetes versus other types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, again, there's as the name implies, associated with pregnancy. Um, Many of us may remember the old white criteria for classification of gestational diabetes. If you remember things like A1 gestational diabetes or A2 gestational diabetes, those are not in wide use anymore, though you may still see periodically people refer to diet-controlled gestational diabetes as A1-type gestational diabetes and medication-controlled gestational diabetes as A2 GDM. And how many people have gestational diabetes? Like, why do we care? Is this really widespread? You know, Faye, it's really hard to know. While ACOG does recommend universal testing, not everyone is tested. Mm -hmm. Um, A 2009 study demonstrated somewhere around 7% of pregnancies occurred in people with diabetes, and around 86% of that 7% um, were women with gestational diabetes. So it's a common enough problem. Um, And again, ACOG does recommend universal screening. Faye, how do we screen? So there are lots of criteria. So I'm going to talk about a few things and, of course, um, wait for part three where Dr. Houston goes even more in depth about the screening of gestational diabetes. A lot of times we will, first of all, screen people based on their medical history and their past obstetric outcomes and family history. But if you are just using history – you probably will fail to get about 50% of people who will go on to develop gestational diabetes. That's a big miss rate. It is. In 1973, O'Sullivan et al. described a one-hour glucose tolerance test with 50 grams of glucose. And then ultimately, the Carpenter-Kustan criteria uh, talks about the one-hour GTT screen, and uh, patients who screen positive uh, will have a glucose of 130 or greater. All pregnant women should be screened between 24 to 28 weeks. And again, if you have someone who is at higher risk, they should undergo early screening. There's not really a consensus as to what early screening can be because early screening, you're really trying to find undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. Mm. 
in some cases, some people will do a two-hour GTT. Some people will stu- still do the one-hour GTT followed by the three-hour GTT if that one-hour screen's positive. And some people will do a hemoglobin A1C. So what happens if they screen positive? So yeah, classically with the carpenter kustin criteria, if you screen positive on the one hour and you don't test for gestational diabetes positive at that point, because on a one hour, you can have a value greater than 200 and automatically be called gestational diabetes. Most people who fall into that value between 130 or whatever your institution uses in 200 will get a second test and what's called two steps testing. So the first 50 gram one hour test establishes a risk. And then the second test is a three-hour glucose tolerance test where pregnant patients will be have their fasting glucose measured, and then they'll receive a 100-gram glucose load. Um, Really disgusting drink, I hear. I've never tried it myself, I have to say. Um, You test positive for gestational diabetes if you have two abnormal values on that 100-gram load test. The classic Carpenter-Kustin criteria... Um, and these are worth memorizing. It says that if you have two out of the four values elevated, then that diagnoses you for gestational diabetes. A fasting glucose should be less than 95. A one hour should be less than 180. A two hour should be less than 155. And a three hour should be less than 140. And we'll post all those on our website for you visual learners. So that way you can keep those numbers in mind. But those are high yield numbers to know. Now, depending on where you are and what kind of testing you do, you may encounter other cutoffs that are not the carpenter kustin criteria. For instance, there's a national diabetes data group that recommends cutoffs at a fasting of 105, a one hour of 190, a two hour of 165, and a three hour of 145. So these numbers are a little bit more lenient. And kind of going back to the data, which will have a little bit of the sampling on our website as well, you can see what the advantages and disadvantages of each are. The last one that we'll talk about as well is actually a one-step testing technique where you eliminate the original screen, Um, and that's the International Association for the Study of Diabetes in Pregnancy Group, IADSPG, and they do a 75-gram two-hour glucose tolerance test where the numbers are even more strange. Now, we've been through all those criteria. That said, even if you only have one value elevated, Studies have shown that there's a significantly increased risk of adverse perinatal outcomes compared to women who did not have gestational diabetes. And so even in these people that you test for and they don't come up positive, it's worthwhile to continue to monitor their pregnancy. So Faye, now that we've talked through all of the testing, why why do we care about testing for gestational diabetes? Yeah, so we care because there are a lot of complications on both the mom and the fetal side. So maternal complications, in people who have gestational diabetes, we know that they are at higher risk of developing preeclampsia and at higher risk of undergoing a cesarean section. They also are at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life. And one study has shown that up to 70% of women with GDM develop type 2 diabetes within 22 to 28 years after pregnancy. Wow, that's pretty high. It's It's a huge number. In terms of fetal complications, These are things that you've probably heard about. These are things like increased risk of macrosomia, neonatal hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, shoulder dystocia, and other birth trauma. Um, Also, with uncontrolled blood sugars, there is also an increased risk of stillbirth. uh, And that's why we'll talk about this later on in the management portion of our episode. But you will need to monitor these patients after 32 weeks if your patient is on insulin for their gestational diabetes. Finally, um, newer data has showed that fetal exposure to maternal diabetes may contribute to adult onset obesity and diabetes um, in the child later on. Got it. So I think, Faye, that about wraps up this first part of gestational diabetes. Why don't we summarize? Sounds good. So we first talked about the physiology of insulin resistance in pregnancy. So remember, we're blaming everything on progesterone and human placental lactogen. Nothing ever changes. <laughs> um, moving from there, we talked about how to diagnose gestational diabetes. The classic carpenter kustin criteria uses two-step methodology. The first is a 50-gram one-hour load, where the cutoff screening value in most institutions is 130, though it may range from 130 to 140, depending on where you are. 
And if that's positive, you do a second three-hour glucose tolerance test with a 100-gram load. And the numbers to remember are fasting 95, one-hour 180, two-hour 155, and three-hour 140. And finally, the reasons why we care, because there are a lot of maternal and fetal complications for gestational diabetes, so we should definitely be screening people for gestational diabetes and treating them. Perfect. So once again, I'm Nick. I'm Faye. And this has been Creogs Over Coffee. And remember, blame everything on progesterone. So guys, if you like this podcast, take a moment to rate us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on social media at Twitter at CreogsOverCoff1, our website www.creogsovercoffee.com, on Facebook at Creogs Over Coffee. Um, and if you have any suggestions or topics that you'd like to hear, you can also email us at creogsovercoffee at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.